Next to an ordinary looking door of the offices of Southampton Civic Centre is a sign which reads, This tablet records that a wing of the Civic Centre was used as a headquarters by the 14th Major Port U.S. Army during World War II. Today, those working in the offices passed the sign without a second glance, unaware that at the time when the U.S. entered World War II and chose Southampton as their base in England, they did so despite the reservations of the British High Command. Southampton suffered badly from Axis bombing in 1940, and on one occasion 14 children were killed when a bomb hit the building. So why did the US Army choose Southampton? Despite diversions, delays and uncertainty, Operation Bolero was successful in bringing to the United Kingdom the men and materials needed for the liberation of Europe. However, as D-Day approached and time grew short and tempers shorter, the relations between the staffs of the Theatre Chief of Transportation and the Southern Base Section became strained since they did not see eye to eye regarding Operation Overlord. The port personnel objected to the interference of the Southern Base Section in technical matters. The poor organisational problems, however, were minor in comparison with those in the operational category. Although the Americans believed the British ports were among the best in the world, they lacked modern equipment and were very poorly manned when judged by American standards. As far as the operational decisions were concerned, it was impractical to assign separate ports entirely to the US Army, but gradually they were given control of American ships and British ports. Apart from inadequate facilities and equipment, the principal limiting factor at the ports was the grave shortage of labour, which persisted throughout 1942 and well into the next year. One example cited by the Americans was the British custom of taking tea breaks in the morning and afternoon. When the dockers took the break first and were followed a little later by the crane operators, operations would be halted from 40 minutes to an hour since the dockers could not function without cranes. During one such break on the Southampton Quayside, GIs thought they would help their allies by unloading a cargo. However, when the dockers returned, tensions were such that the troops were obliged to replace the cargo to be unloaded again by the dockers. During the summer and fall of 1943, the activity of the 14th Port at Southampton was interrupted by a number of strikes, several of which represented protests against the presence of American military police who were stationed in the hatches to prevent pilferage. However, in general, the development of American port activities followed a basic pattern. Initially completely dependent on the British, U.S. Army personnel quickly established close relations with British port and transportation authorities, and orientated themselves to British methods of operation. Then, as the necessary personnel and experience were obtained, they gradually were given considerable freedom of action. In the following December, the 12th Port began relieving the 14th Port, which was slated to expand its operations at Southampton and Plymouth, and prepare for the cross-channel assault. At this time, Southampton became the principal US port on the south coast, in peacetime, a thriving passenger port and a familiar gateway for visitors to the British Isles, it was closed to non-essential traffic for two years during the war. Yet Southampton remained one of the best ports in England. Deep water and relatively little tidal range with seven graving docks for ship repair, the Americans reopened the port in the summer of 1943. Early in 1944, the headquarters of the 14th Port was officially moved from London to Southampton. As well as using a wing of the Civic Centre, billets were obtained in and near the city at Blymount Barracks and two hotels, including the Polygon. Perhaps because of the fear of impending danger, cargo handling was greatly improved and except for minor squabbles, labour disputes practically ceased. Southampton, together with the other ports along the southern and eastern shores of Great Britain, including the Thames and Humber River areas, contributed substantially to the build-up in the British Isles by receiving cargo diverted from the heavily burdened Bristol Channel 
and Mersey River ports, particularly after July 43. But Southampton's principal wartime contribution was to be made as a port of embarkation. In the months preceding D-Day, the emphasis in transportation corps operations increasingly shift from receiving personnel and cargo to planning and preparation. During May 44, with Lieutenant Colonel Leo J. Mayer in command, all cargo discharge operations ceased at Southampton and the port personnel concentrated their efforts on preparation for Normandy. From D-Day onwards, the Southampton port of embarkation had a key role in the outbound movement of US troops, equipment and supplies. Yet, because of its proximity to the continent, its excellent facilities and the experienced Army Port organization, Southampton remained active to the end of the war.